Welcome to Culture Labs Detroit Dialogue. Uh, welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts, and maybe for some of you in the audience, welcome to Detroit. It's a, just a, a joy to see this kind of energy in the room for, for this event. I'm Rip Raps, and I'm the president of the Kresge Foundation. If you're not uh, familiar with exactly what the Kresge Foundation is or does, uh, we're based in Troy. We work to expand opportunities in cities across America, and we have a special bond with the city of Detroit, dating back to when we were founded here in 1924. Everywhere we work, we work with partners. We do nothing alone. And I'm here tonight to sing the praises to one special Detroit area partner. I want to thank Jane Shulak and her collaborators in the Culture Lab Detroit project, specifically the Detroit Creative Quarter Center and the College for Creative Studies. And and Rick Rogers, the head of the college, is, is here and an invaluable partner always. They've evidenced and, uh, and you see, it will see tonight, manifested a spirit of partnership that pervades all of their work. The conversation that we're going to get to in just a minute um, promises to be thoughtful, exploratory, and yet in tune with the very real challenges and opportunities that present themselves in the city of Detroit. This is really a trademark of Culture Lab's three short but impressive years on the scene. Jane has figured out one way or another, and I'm not quite sure how, um, how to tap into streams of cultural energy that are coursing through Detroit. And she connects those streams to the energies of the national and the international design communities. Jane brings together ideas that are sometimes lofty with the ground truths of Detroit. She has a knack for fostering invigorating conversations in what we might think of as a new middle ground. And of course, we know where good conversation can lead. Good conversation can spark new ideas and plans, and the next thing you know, we could be building something the world's never seen before. I don't know about you, but I'm anxious to see where tonight's conversation in particular takes us. So Jane, it's all yours, and thank you so much. Thank you, Rip. I am truly honored. As the founder of Culture Lab Detroit, I'm delighted to welcome you to another evening of conversation and collaboration. That is the mission of Culture Lab Detroit, to spark collaboration within Detroit's flourishing cultural scene and between Detroit and the rest of the creative world. How appropriate that we hold this conversation here at the Detroit Institute of Arts with its own storied history that maybe more than any other place represents both an old and a new day in Detroit. This historic building and the exquisite works within its walls have been the pride of our city for many generations and in so many ways stand as the rock on which Detroit will be rebuilt. And that is what we are here to consider this evening this exciting moment when the sharp edges of Detroit's past are beginning to give way to a lush green future. Our guests this evening have set the tone for this conversation on a global scale. Please allow me to introduce our esteemed guests. Architect Su Fujimoto, which this seems to be my theme, if any of you were with us last night, is going to be joining us by Skype because of terrible weather um, in New York and no flights leaving. So I'm going to continue to introduce him and he will appear in a few minutes. <laughs> it worked last night. Um, architect Su Fujimoto joins us from Tokyo, Japan, where he founded his firm, Su Fujimoto Architects. His work has been recognized internationally. His process is collaborative and experimental, and the outcome primitive yet avant-garde. He is also noted for his use of natural materials and his relationship with the environment. In 2013, he became the youngest architect to design the annual summer pavilion for the Serpentine Gallery in London. The following year, Sue was awarded the Wall Street Journal Architecture Innovator Award. Previously, he was awarded the Golden Lion for Best National Participation at the Japan Pavilion at La Biennale de Venezia. His other important works include House N.A., 
Musashino Art University Museum and Library, Final Wooden House, and House N, many of which I hope he shares with us this evening. So Sue, thank you for coming eventually and welcome. <laughs> World-renowned landscape architect Walter Hood is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. His Oakland-based studio is known for transformative designs in landscape architecture. His firm's many projects include the new de Young Museum in San Francisco, the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, and the Sculpture Terrace for the Jackson, Wyoming Museum of Wildlife Art. Recently, Walter won design competitions for the Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta, and he is the recipient of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Landscape Design. Walter, we look forward to you sharing your work and your wisdom. And finally, I welcome back our moderator, Reed Kroloff, a beloved treasure of the Detroit arts community who has been a mentor and friend to Culture Lab Detroit from the very beginning. An accomplished architect, Reed was previously director of Cranbrook Academy of Art and Art Museum here in Bloomfield Hills and dean of the Tulane School of Architecture in New Orleans. Reed is the recipient of the American Academy in Rome's 2003 Pri Rome Prize Fellowship. He also served as editor-in-chief of Architecture Magazine. Reed is the founding principal of Jones Kroloff, a unique practice that develops strategy for clients in the architecture and design industry, and also guides architecture selection processes. The firm's clients have included the American Society of Interior Designers, the Boston Convention Center Authority, the Chicago Architecture Foundation, the Aspen Art Museum, the Cleveland Museum of Contemporary Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the University of Chicago, Yale University, Global Green Brad Pitt, Motown, the History Channel, and many, many others. Reed is a regular critic at architecture schools across the country. We are delighted to have you with us, Reed. With that, let's begin our conversation. I present to you our moderator, Reed Kroloff. Thank you, Jane. No one's ever told me I was beloved before. <laughs> except my mom. She doesn't live in Detroit, so. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we've got a terrific evening for you, uh, and I know you're really going to enjoy our speakers. Let me tell you a little bit about how this will work uh, the, this evening, and then we will get right to the meat of the matter. But first, I also would like to add my thanks to Jane for pulling together this extraordinary program, um, the third, as she said, and I know all of, uh, a number of you have participated in uh, previous incarnations every year that uh, Culture Lab gets stronger and stronger uh, and more and more complicated. Sue Fujimoto um, and, uh, and Alice Waters. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's only the ambition of the event that leads to the opportunities to create remarkable solutions to late-term problems. So, uh, Jane, congratulations on an extraordinary thing. Um, what will happen tonight is, um, first we'll have a presentation from Walter Hood. This will be the last time you see me at this podium because, uh, because of Sue being uh, not here in, in person, I'm gonna have to sit on stage uh, right next to the screen to be able to ask him questions, uh, that's just the way the technology will work. So we're gonna hear from Walter, uh, who will make a presentation about his work. Then we believe we'll be joined by Sue Fujimoto, who will make a presentation about his work. Then I will ask them some questions, and then you will ask them some questions. And I think it's that last part that's the most important, so I'm going to try and keep my part of the uh, Q&A to as brief a time as possible, no more than three hours. Uh, <laughs> And then you'll, then you'll have at least 30 seconds to ask all of your questions after that. So, um, no, we'll try and keep it as tightly focused as we can because I really do believe that this is an event for the greater 
uh, Detroit uh, uh, area and, and those of us who are working so hard uh, to make this city uh, something exceptional once again. So um, with that, I'd like to welcome a, a good friend and someone who is truly an extraordinary force in the worlds of architecture, landscape architecture, and art. Uh, he really defies any singular definition, um, as Jane's introduction uh, might have suggested to you. So please, help me welcome Walter Hood. Hello, Detroit. <laughs> Always good to be back here. I think this is probably a half dozen time in the last five years, thanks to Reed and um, my new best friend, Maurice Cox, who couldn't be here because he's lecturing in Michigan. Uh, he sends his condolences and apologies. Um, it's gonna be quite awkward with the screen and that guy, that's not Sue, by the way. <laughs> um, so don't focus on the guy. Sue will appear, and when I see him, I'm gonna stop. And so that will be our prompt, okay? So again, it's a pleasure. Thanks to the Cultural Lab for inviting me here to share my work and to share hopefully some knowledge. But more importantly, it's just a great place to be here in Detroit. There's so much energy in the city. I was here two weeks ago and I came back today and it seemed different. Uh, it changed that fast and change can happen that fast. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about designing for today's urban landscape. The title was Architecture and Nature, and I have to say, I don't think of landscape as nature. Nature, we're all part of that. So I would like to talk more about architecture and the environment, particularly the landscape, and the changing landscapes that we work in. And when I say we, I'm gonna use that a lot. That's Hood Design, my studio, which is eight people who are working really hard right now in California. I'm gonna start pos with a positing a couple ideas. This is a project we did in San Francisco, and what you're looking at is Treasure Island from a house up on Telegraph Hill. Uh, and the view is of redwoods, which you see over Marin, but the redwoods actually veil the city down below. So every day they come out and they see the redwoods of Marin and the bay, and they don't see all that junk down below. But that idea really comes out of this notion that architecture has boundary, and through that boundary, that's what gives us a lens to see the world around us. If you live with bad architecture, the spaces around you are probably pretty awful, right? Great architecture really tries to take that boundary and create this, note, this idea of presencing, like a window. A window will give you something, making something present, you present, right? We're always there. Architecture can say something about people that you don't even see, that they are there. So as we try to construct a new narrative in the 21st century, how do we talk about those people that we don't know, the people we know, and the people we want to be? And that's an idea I want to talk about in the work. Another idea, this is a project in Hunter's Point at the shipyard. Uh, it's, an old, it's a view that's three-dimensional. It's a sculpture about 40 feet by 60 feet. And it's three-dimensional, and you can actually walk through a picture. It was taken from a picture before they raped the landscape and changed it. We took a picture, then we codified it through this three-dimensional piece. But I'd like you to think of Wallace Stevens' antidote to a jar, right? Which is idea, if I place something in the landscape, it should transform that thing, right? And so every time we make something, right, it should make the world around it rise up to it. And it should give us a different way, again, to think. I first heard this from Mark Tribe in architecture class, and I kept thinking, why is he saying this over and over and over? And then you go out into the world and you see it, a tower out in the landscape traveling through Spain and seeing a bull up on the hills, right? You start hearing, right, the scrumming of the guitars, right? You go into Manhattan, you see these tall things popping up on an island. It changes your whole view. So through projects, we try to think about these ideas, and I'm gonna go blitz through a lot of projects because I think the urban landscape, you can't solve it through a singular sort of way. It's multidimensional. You gotta be agile, you gotta be thick skinned, and you gotta be interested in one thing, people, right? People. You gotta be interested in people if you're making urban spaces, architectural landscape. If you're not, get a new profession, <laughs> really. I mean, every time I get introduced in a lot of lectures, like, well, Walter, he really thinks about people. And I wonder, well, what do other architects think about? What do other designers think about? That's central to our work. This first project is called Find the Rivers. It's in Pittsburgh, and why would you try to find the rivers in Pittsburgh? Because the rivers are always there. The rivers actually created Pittsburgh. The Hill District, most people will tell you, go to Pittsburgh, don't go to the Hill. Don't go there, it's dangerous. And the Hill 
was this place where they extracted a lot of minerals out of it, coal in particular. It had seven hills, not one hill. The people who live on the hill used the stairs to get through the hill. But again, we created a plan with them over four years to talk about the rivers. Don't find it. The rivers have found you. It's created this new emergent landscape. But can you make a landscape that begins to talk to those rivers? And can we live in the woods again? Right? What's wrong with living in the woods? Can we build housing? Can we move through the woods in a different way other than a great iron plant and respect those rivers? Can we begin to think about circulation? And then can we think about development in a completely different way, maybe in a small compact way that has a relationship with those rivers? And then through that, can we have a different sort of nomenclature to talk about the landscape? And this is called the green print for the Hill District, and it's guiding their development right now to think about how to come back to a landscape where people left. And people left it for a lot of reasons. It started out as a very diverse place, like most cities, like Detroit, a very multicolored place. But when people have access to leave, they leave those who can't leave. And those who are left, they're being told, there's nothing here for you. You're nothing. But how can we empower, again, the people who are there, the people who are present? And here, we actually created a donut. And my client thinks of this as Central Park, a reverse of Central Park. We have a hole in the middle, right? And we're surrounded by this furry thing. And in a way, this furry thing is the river. It's protecting the river. So you can go to the Hill District and actually see turkeys. You can actually see kids playing in the woods. You can actually walk through. And this is in the hill. This is like one mile from downtown, right? Rabbits, turkeys. We didn't design this. The landscape designed this. The emergent landscape came back. And it's hard to talk to people about this. How do you keep this without taking all of this out and making it new, tapas vert, right? And as I speak, some of this plan is not being implemented because for a lot of people, this image is scary, right? To not control, to not con have control or dominion over this landscape. But I would argue people have lived here for the last 30 years. They've raised their kids. They've gone through school, right? They've had more kids, and they still live there. And so there's no way we can deny that this place is not a healthy place for people to live. This next project is called Curtain Call. While we were working there, I got a call from the Arts uh, Council, and they said, we're building this arena. We need a landscape architect to come in and help us do a rain garden for this arena. Now this is another thing that landscape people do. Architects call you, I want to catch the rain, I want to get my lead points, right? But then they said, as well with my lead points, there's this kind of thing that we haven't talked about. You know, it's kind of redevelopment. We like kind of push people out. Can you do two things? Can you do me a rain garden? And can you actually talk about the people who used to be here? even though we're not gonna talk about it. We're just gonna build a big hockey stadium and we're gonna like have Mariola Mew and all these people out there. So we said, okay, we can do it. And so getting to know Pittsburgh, I started thinking about you know, how to talk about this project and we called it Curtain Call. And August Wilson, thinking about August Wilson and how he carried the city on his back throughout his career, we came up with a project that one, cleaned the water, but also talked about the flora and the fauna, but also talked about the people here. And the curtain call was we asked 7,000, we wanted 7,000 images from people to help us actually tell the story. And the Arts Council said, Walter, we'll give you the project, but we don't think you're going to get 7,000 photos. And I said, we'll see. And so the rain gardens will be covered by these giant quilts of photographs. So we had our first call. And during that first meeting, everybody came out of the woodwork, right, with pictures, to talk about their parents, to talk about the life in the hill. We then had to get a scanner. We then had to get a tape recorder because the stories were actually better than the images. And for people, it was a moment. It was a memory to begin to talk about a way to cultivate the space. And some of the images were just mind blowing. And we're putting them on century glass and they'll go up and form this giant curtain that faces west so every day at sunset next to the Church of the Moors, the glass will light up next to Mario. And this is one of the women there. Isn't she gorgeous? She saw one of my lectures on YouTube, emailed me and said, next time you're in town, boy, you better take me out to breakfast. <laughs> and I had to, right? She's gorgeous. And there's August over there. There are two couples up there kissing on top of Sugar Hill. So, no, Sweetwater. Sweetwater is where all the water was kept, the, the highest point. It was called Sweetwater. And at Sweetwater, all the preachers lived around Sweetwater to bless the water, to keep the water pure. 
So these stories are really fantastic. And so we decided that we would make a project that was at once a landscape, but how to bring that cultural landscape in. And we decided to look deep into the cultural history. And what we found out was Pittsburgh was called the Chicago of the East. It had some Lena Horn, um, what's his name, played the guitar. Benson, George Benson, all of these guys were there. I didn't know anything about it. So we said, hmm, how could we create this zeitgeist between a rain garden? So we started collecting rain songs. And we said, if we collect rain songs, R&B rain songs, can we then prompt you when you come into the rain garden to hear this? And there would be this sort of tension between culture and the actual landscape. Let's see if this works. Against my window, I can't stand the rain. Against my window, bringing back sweet memories. I can't stand the rain. Against my window, cause you're not here. University of Buffalo. It's another competition, art competition. And we won this competition. Very simple idea. Can we take this green square, can an artist take 5,000 PV panels, three by five, and create a piece of art? And Vito Acconci, myself, and uh, Diana, what's Diana's last? Balmori was selected, and we actually ended up winning. And our scheme was not about the solar panels at all. <laughs> this is our scheme. The project is down there. This is University of Buffalo Amherst. And what you see here is a suburban campus that used to be agricultural. They moved the creek to build a campus. And no one talked about, well, what the effect of moving the creek would be, right? <laughs> Huge. All the topsoil, no more alluvium. Every plant that they've planted has not grown very dry. It's just grass. And so we found the old patch. And we said, can we make a new project right here that catches the patch? Now, the patch comes from the creek being moved. And by doing that, we were able then to create a new identity for the university and talk about it. Now, it's just not talking about the past, but it's talking about how can we bring that creek back and get the patch. And so this was our scheme. And we said, lay out the PV panels in these scripts, scrans, and follow the scrans, follow the stream. And we know scrans follow coasts, they follow streams. And as the water moves out, the landscape will actually change. And here it is built. It was built three years ago. It's about 15 acres total. And what's happened as an object is changed the landscape around them. We talk them into changing the mowing regi regiment. You don't mow the grass anymore, just let it go. And so the scripts have begun to proliferate the campus because we're trying to get them to stop mowing the grass. The students then said, wow, what's going on out here? Can we help? So every May day, they help us plant. And then they have like blue glasses. Now I don't know why blue, but blue for the, the lenses. Kids come out here for educational purposes and it's a wild landscape. And I show this because, for me, we let the landscape go. And having this technological thing floating in this wild landscape is the weirdest thing imaginable, right? Because the solar panels make no noise, but the rodents, the animals do. And to have it, this sort of technological thing going on and this live landscape going on is pretty mind-blowing. And then we were able to get all the recycled material from campus, the concrete, and then we became a certified wildlife habitat. This happened this year. And this was not proposed. The idea was just, can we put this object out there and how could that object change the landscape, a la Wallace Stevens? And it has. People come there. It's a public space. As um, my friend was showing the, uh, the site, this is Al probably telling me a lot of you know, big, big stories. He said, yeah, Walter, I was walking these ladies out through the path and this hawk came down, grabbed the groundhog, ripped his head off, Oof. And they went, wow. And this all happened in the solar strand. And they were like, wow, this is a wildlife habitat. And he's like, we saw cougar prints out there and all kinds of stuff. I don't believe I'll, but hey, I'll go with it, right? But you do see these little guys out there, right? See these little groundhogs. You see all of this. You see birds flying overhead. And you see these panels. And so again, it's that moment where things come together that I don't have to say anything, but people actually begin to understand where they are and how to tap into that landscape through infrastructure. 
And so it's a place now for gathering on campus. It's a place for all the weird things to happen on campus. Uh, if you want to fight PETA, you go to the solar strand. You put the, you put the furs out and you talk about it. But this is the metrics. You can go to the windshield and you can actually understand a lot of the things that's actually happening through the windshield. This next project opens next month. This is the Broad Museum done with DSR for Eli Broad. Um, it's next to the Geary, which is not being shown to the right. We did the landscape for this, working with Liz and Rick, trying to extend MOCA across the street into this new museum. And this is Los Angeles, Bunker Hill, sitting on top of pretty much nothing. We didn't have any space. So we actually <laughs> built a freeway, as you see here, and we turned it upside down. And by turning it upside down, the beams that hold the freeway, we put dirt in it. We were able to get like six to seven feet of dirt. And on top of that dirt, then, we were able to plant a lawn and plant trees. On the sidewalks, again, not having dirt, we have these ruptures. So we let the landscape come up, and through that, the green actually establishes itself. There's nothing below us but a tunnel, right? And so again, as you're walking, you're going, what the heck are these bulbous things? But hopefully, you begin to sort of understand they're floating. Now, the skateboarders love this, I'm hearing. I just talked to the Times yesterday because they love that little upturn piece. But there are no trees along here because there's no space below the ground. Right? And everywhere else along here, there are trees. And it's this idea of not thinking about where you are. Right? And then leading yourself back across, we decided to make a grove. And the grove actually catches your eye. And we were able to get these 110-year-old olive trees from Northern California and bring them down. So they've been there 110 years. Right? And then we just have to bring a freeway in. So there's this, again, a conversation between two acts. And maybe this tree died and we actually made it into a stool, or maybe it didn't. But again, getting landscape to register with people, to get them to question and try to understand where they are, fact or fiction. You know, I'm from the South. Telling stories is a, is a great way to get people to kind of understand one another. And the stories don't always have to be truthful. Some of the best ones are big <laughs> fictions. Pearl Street, back to Philadelphia here. We were asked to come to Pearl Street to look at this alley and to change the alley into a park. And my friend Gail was like, Walter, I heard you speak. I really want you to come. And you and Theaster, you guys were talking about green. Come and make my alley a park. And I lived in Philadelphia. I'm like, why would you want to make an alley a park? And again, not thinking about where you live. The beautiful part of Philadelphia are the alleys. And the alleys came about through culture. And so it was our job then to try to talk about, well, why do you want to make it a park? So we went through Philadelphia and we pretty much made a matrix of all the cool alleys. This is Pearl Street. This is why they wanted to make a park. They couldn't see that, right? That's in Center City. They couldn't see it. They couldn't imagine it. They couldn't imagine a 400 bed homeless shelter. They couldn't imagine new hipsters in art apartments. They couldn't imagine Chinatown really embracing the same aesthetic, that it had to be different. So we said, after a meeting of meeting with all these people and being told over and over, it's the people in the homeless shelter. Oh, it's the Chinese people. Oh, it's the hipsters. Everybody's blaming everybody. We said, screw this, let's make chairs. <laughs> and the great thing about making chairs is everybody could agree that Queen Anne and Chippendale is great for Philly, right? Got them all together out in the alley. We made them, painted the alley, and then got the kids involved, and then we had dinner. <laughs> and again, what was beautiful about this, by the time we got here, the stinkiness of this, few rats running by, people didn't see it. And they started to see the Philadelphia Alley. And then we could take them on a trip and say, OK, maybe there is a different way to think about the alley. There are ways that we can utilize this alley to make different things. Get light in there. Get people back in there so that maybe we can begin to have a different discussion about the alleys, and maybe the alleys are not about the history, but about the 20, 21st century. Right? Windows were a big thing here. There are no windows in the alley, and that's why people do bad things in alleys, because there are no windows. And one of the guys in the homeless shelter told me, Walter, when you live in the dark, you want to do bad things. And it just hit me. So we were like, we got to bring light in here. So we came up with these different vitrines. Artists can work with people at the homeless shelter, opening up their light, having projection in the alley, and getting people to really think about it. And after two years, I went back last year, said, can you do this again? Nothing happened. 
And I remember seeing a seagull at Mocha in Los Angeles that had a woman sitting here looking out the window. And I'm sure this was based on Philadelphia. So we made our own seagull last year, since people didn't have windows. And the weirdest thing were people wanted to be in the window. The strangest thing, people coming, taking photos, take my photo in the window. And I was like, all you have to do is like, oh, put a window there. But people did not want to take that chance because it's a risk. If you put a window in, it's a risk. They would rather have this risk, right? These floating risks. But through it all, we left them with a master plan and these active agents that everyone has to be active within the landscape for it to change. I got about five. This next project is close to my heart. And read, maybe this is a different way of saying it. Oak land, right? <laughs> Most people who live in my city don't know why it's called Oakland, right? Because we don't hyphenate it, it's Oakland, right? There's an Oakland in Pittsburgh, right? It was called Oakland for a reason, guys. There were oak trees, lots of oak trees. This is what Oakland looked like before uh, the earthquake of 1906 in San Francisco. It was a suburb of San Francisco. The oaks grew actually all the way down to the bay, which ecologically is an anomaly in the bay. It grew along a ridge line. Downtown Oakland is the highest point from estuary to bay, and the oaks loved it. And they probably loved the temperature, and they probably loved the moisture that was not wet enough, right, to kill them, and they thrived. But when the earthquake happened, people moved over to the city, they got rid of them all. And then there's the whole story of losing the oaks but keeping the name. Here's 1857. You can kind of see the patch is right there. That's all oaks. Downtown is right here. There's the estuary. You can be over in San Francisco and actually see the oak trees coming all the way down. So when you arrive to Oakland, you actually have to go through an Oakland, which is kind of cool. Huh? Today, you see none of that. <clears throat> see if this works. So in 1900, you can kind of see that over time, pretty much we got rid of all the oak trees. We have a project now to return the oaks back to Oakland. And I have a fellowship where I'm starting out with 1,000 and hope we can reach a million. And we're taking households and we're actually wedding, I use my class to actually wed single family residents with an oak tree. My students had to basically take care of an oak tree for a semester. And if they killed it, they had a contract, they had to like, get a new one, but the idea was <laughs> trees are not just something you go out and plant, it's something you have to cultivate. And then we put them in the neighborhood and now we're giving them out to residents. And then the New York Times came out and these are two of my grad students, there's Stephanie, um, who is just fantastic. The students love it, just this idea of working in the community. Again, it's not a larger scale advocacy, but it's a small thing, little Johnny apple seeds, right? Planting these seeds. Um, and then we did a big scrim, so people in the neighborhood are educated to why we're doing this. And this is an ongoing project. This is something dear to my heart, unfunded. I'm using my own grant money to do it. And hopefully over time, we'll cultivate a larger sort of group of people thinking about Oakland again. This is uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, a project just crazy. Who's been to Jackson, Wyoming? Yeah. You go to Jackson because it's wild, right? It's a landscape, a moraine, this glacier moraine, the Snake River, all this stuff. It's one of the most urban places I've ever been in my life. <laughs> you get up in the morning, there's a traffic jam. People drive big cars. You go in the summertime, a million, probably five million people come through the valley. This is the Jackson Wildlife Museum. It had about a couple hundred cars parked up on this sort of bluff. That's a building right there, that's the museum. It looks like a, a ruin, which it was supposed to be a Scottish ruin. But when I arrive there, we want a project to do a sculpture trail. So I arrive there, park my car, and I'm like, where would you put a trail? Right? The entire parking lot, the parking lot was too, 80 feet wide. Because they expected campers. Campers never came. But they still maintained this big blacktop. Every year they would put slurry on it. During the summer it bubbled. During the winter they had to remove the snow. All that money. And we said, why don't you just get rid of some of this stuff? Right? And thank God, again, 2008 happened. Mr. Obama put out an infrastructure fund, and we get a trail out, and we were able to say, change the entire visitor experience, push the parking lot back, and let's do an overlook. Let's do a terrace. And on opening day, this was the image I got. The parking, you don't see it. It's behind you. 
We only lost less than a half, a third of the parking. There's no parking issues. And now people actually come out and do things in the space that a car once dominated in a place where people want to be in the landscape. Right? And again, no one thought of this. It's the kind of the simplest idea to me. Their idea was probably to put a sidewalk next to the parking lot and then put sculpture on it. Okay? <laughs> and thank God they had great leadership and we were able to get this. Now the road where you get millions of people coming is down below us, but we push the bench out so that moraine comes forward. And in this landscape, if you take away scale, familiar stuff like cars, you actually will see a moose. You might see something, but if you have the scale of other things, you won't see it because it's bigger and it's more familiar to us, just like that screen over there. I keep seeing you guys look at that. It's the same idea, right? <laughs> And now people move out into the landscape, and that landscape tells you something about the place you want to be. So it's less about the thing we made. The thing we made actually is just the boundary that allows the landscape to come forward. Right on time. Is he not here yet? I guess. I'll keep going. This next project the last project, so come on, Sue. Um, does anyone know where this is? Oh, Sue, what's up, man? You gotta wait for me now, I started, man, okay? Um, San Francisco. Hi, it could be a bit lower. That's Golden Gate Park. It's a fiction, if you've ever been there. It's a joke. Uh, hello, hello. You gotta wait, Can you hear me? No, thank you. <laughs> Un momento. Okay. Um, really quick, I'm going to blast through this because Sue is here. But what I wanted to talk about Golden Gate Park and the New de Young Museum is most people think this park has always been there, that this is the real flora and fauna of San Francisco. It's a giant sand dune. Basically, mountains were topped to bring topsoil out to create a fiction that we love. And over time, that landscape came to fruition. People today come to it and they think it's been there all along. Right? And again, this is really important to understand because it costs a lot to maintain that fiction. Right? That fiction, every time you plant a tree, you gotta bring dirt from somewhere. Right? Water has to get out there. It's sand. Water wants to go back to the ocean. Working with Herzog and Dimon, we were able to try to talk about this fiction by using the plant material and the fictitious landscape, this is a parking garage, to talk about things that are not real. All the plants that you'll see, I'm gonna blast through this, are within a quarter mile of the museum. That they were given, and so they're exotics, some are locally grown, but they're not native to a sand dune. No, we don't. From inside to outside, these are ferns that were given from Australia. We riffed on that. They break through the building. We were um, able to sort of think about the local fauna by making natural systems for people to place their frogs and other things in. And then places for children versus places for more high art. And then the building, as it worked in between, it creates this boundary. Again, as I go back to my original, original quote, in which you can see the landscape in different ways. And the landscape allows you to see the building in another way. And as we were working, Jacques and Pierre were always talking about that reverse kind of way of understanding architecture through the, the veil of landscape. And through the sculpture and through the placement of things, we think we have this great dialectic between this fiction Without telling people it's a fiction, it forces people again to think about where they are and question it, whether good or bad. Question why things are a certain way and then act upon it. Thank you so much. The problem with Walter, and has always been a problem with Walter, is a distinct lack of energy. So I hope you guys are all still awake. <laughs> now, so how are you? Uh, great. <laughs> Good. Uh, not great, finally, yeah. I'm sorry I couldn't get out of uh, New York City, so. It's all right. We still, we're still happy to have you with us. I just want to, this is going to be a little awkward, OK? So Sue and I are on a first date, and you guys are get to watch. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Reed, and I'm your moderator. And this Hi. is Walter Hood. Hi, Sue. Hi, nice to see you. 
And what's going to happen now, and, and, and these are 300 of our closest friends <laughs> out here who have come to see you. <laughs> um, and so what we're going to do now is ask you to make your presentation in about 20 minutes, OK? Mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Yeah. And we won't interrupt you during that time frame, OK? And then we're going to go to a question and answer session, which is going to be interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. So we, are, are you good with that? OK, great. OK. Take it away. <laughs> OK, so can I start? Yes. <laughs> As I said. Yeah, yes. It's a bit uh, strange feeling since it's the first time to do this kind of a, a high-tech uh, lecture. Uh, I hope you uh, to enjoy, enjoy this situation. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, today I tried to get out of the New York City, going to Detroit, but finally I couldn't, I, I couldn't do that. And it's strange, my luggage was, su was successful to, uh, to be <laughs> in the New York place. So now, yeah, he's around New York City. I, I hope you take care of him. <laughs> but anyway, okay. I will start my presentation. It's, it's only 20 minutes. OK, so please. Uh, OK, so uh, today I brought uh, several projects relating to the relationships between nature and architecture. And uh, OK, yeah, I'd like to start from my simple background. I, I was born in the Hokkaido. It's a northern island, quite nature -like. So. From the baby day to 18 years old, I was playing in that kind of a nature area. And then after that, I came to Tokyo. It's, uh, as you can see, it's a really crazy artificial city. But, uh, and then I'm based in Tokyo now. So I have these two opposite background, nature and artificial things. And then I find out I'm, I'm really interested in dealing with two of them sometimes mix them or sometimes using the artificial things to create nature things or to using nature things to create artificial architectural places. So kind of a mixture too is the, my background and my architectural attitude, I think. So these projects are sometimes not using real nature, but to try to create the nature-like things by artificial things or sometimes bringing the actual nature into architectures. And this first project was uh, two years ago. It happened two years ago in London, in the Serpentine, uh, in front of the Serpentine Gallery. It's a summer pavilion. And as you can see, it's surrounded by beautiful nature. So I try to create really artificial, but at the same time cloud-like or uh, something like a nature nature feelings. And it is made by a two centimeter thin steel pipes to make the 40 centimeter grids to create the whole structure. So everything is made by the two centimeter and the really straight line and 90 degree grids. So it's super artificial uh, order. But finally, as you can see, it is really like a soft cloud-like feelings. And it is, yeah, it has an interior space. You couldn't see exactly where is the interior and where is the exterior because it's super transparent. But uh, you can see some people behind the structure that is the interior spaces. And the basic program was a cafe. So we tried to create, uh, of course, like a usual cafe, but not only usual cafe, but more multi-use, uh, multi-purpose spaces because here is in the in the middle of the park. So people could come and then behave as they like, sometimes, uh, how to say, reading books, and sometimes just, uh, just sit on, and sometimes together with your friends. So various different behaviors is possible. So we try to create kind of a, the platforms or the landscape uh, for people where uh, they can choose their choice or they can behave as they like. So it is like an artificial uh, geometrical landscaping. 
And you can see this stepping area is a 40 centimeters, so it's good for seating or uh, the, yeah, you can climbing up uh, on it. And people are behaving, as you can see, uh, as they like. And the whole structures are made by the same materials. So not only the landscaping part, but the roofs or walls are, are made by the same materials. And it's amazing because the transparency is, is always, how to say, changing gradiently. It's not like a walls and windows, but more like a, like a cloud. Some part is getting more and more dense and some part is getting more and more transparent. And uh, as you walk around, then the transparencies and densities is changing according to your position. So it is not like a usual architecture. It's uh, made by the walls and windows, but it's more like uh, made by the densities of the airs. And you will find changing or transitions of transparencies as you're walking around. So it's, it's quite amazing experiences. And yeah, it's, it has a kind of a stepping area. So it inspire people to, for example, even the old lady, inspire old lady to, to walk up in this kind of a, a steeper steps. And sometimes they yeah, sit on or behaving in several different way. And in the evening, finally, light up and uh, yeah, surrounded by nature. So it's quite different, of course, from the nature, but in some different levels, it's quite similar. Maybe because of this complexity, the nice mixtures of the simplicity and complexity, it is kind of the second nature or another nature like always. And then this is after the serpentine, this is uh, the small installations in Paris, just in front of the, the Google. It's really amazing space. And it is like uh, the mixtures of the cubes. But we put the vegetations, trees, small trees, some on the, some of the cubes. And then to create, finally, it has also the interior spaces. So the interior space are surrounded by cubes as well as surrounded by floating uh, greens. So greens and the cubes, artificial cubes, are equally uh, creating the uh, territories for, for the people. So this is render. So it is, yeah, it is pixelized, artificial pixelized uh, structures. And then the size scales of the one pixels is similar to the size of the trees. So it's a scaling is, is the key of this project. And this is the model. And uh, yeah, this is it. So this is another, how to say it, way to mix nature things and the architecture or artificial things. And this is a house, a real house. It's a, in Tokyo, in the middle of Tokyo. And here, yeah, as you can see, the plot is quite small. So we try to, if we gave up to have the bigger living space because, uh, because yeah, anyway, the plot is quite small. So we tried to create more three-dimensional richness and the varieties of the, the areas where clients could choose in, the, in their daily life. So we finally, we divide this small plot in a smaller, smaller pieces of the flat slab. It's almost like the size of the furniture and then stuck them up in a several different levels to create like a three-dimensional, uh, how to say, the field for, for them. So inside is something like this. So it is, of course, made by the super steel straight line and flat slabs, but the experience is more like, a, how to say, the climbing the trees in the forest. It reminds me in my childhood days, it's a climbing the trees like things. So of course, appearance, is really architectural, but the experiences of physical impression, physical reaction is more like a, a interactive uh, reaction to the nature like things. And then this project is a bit, uh, it is a small public toilet, but it looks like this. <laughs> yeah, it's a toilet in the nature. About the glass, but we designed the glass box, toilet, and the black walls around it. So that black wall is uh, the key. So it is like this from above. So you will see 
the big black wall it's surrounding, it's about 2.23 meter high. So it is, the black wall is blocking the view from outside, even from the train. And then inside of this wall is like a more private garden and it has a door and you can lock the door for the black, black wall. So <laughs> once you are inside, then it is like, a, how to say, secret garden. And then you can, you know, do the toilet in a, such a glass box, open, open, open feelings. But yeah, it's a, yeah, this is the plan. So the oval shape is the black wall, and then you open the door, left hand, and then you will see the glass box yeah, inside. Uh, so it, it perfectly works. The privacy is blocked by the black wall, but the, you can feel the openness in this nature, of, uh, nature field. And of course, sometimes, yeah, someone who is in the kind of a emergency situations, it's a bit tricky toilet because if you finally reach to the door and open the door and then you will see 20 meter more to, to walk <laughs> to reach to the toilet. But anyway, yeah, it's, it works. And uh, yeah, this is kind of a really simple way to introduce nature things into architectures to create the, how to say, to split the walls in two pieces. One is to just block the view, and another one is just to block the air. So then, if you have a distance, you can bring the nature in to your, how to say, private areas. So sometimes that kind of, a, how to say, shifting the distances or shifting the, to create a space between the wall is, is quite a clever way, in a sense, to, to make it. Yeah, it's, it looks funny, but uh, it's, I think it's kind of an intellectual treatment of the wall is happening in this uh, funny, crazy project. And it is uh, the real one, but uh, they, the city is promoting like an art city, so they are pushing this kind of uh, Rather, kind of a strange artistic uh, public facilities in their cities, and uh, yeah, but uh, I've heard there are a lot of tourists now coming by bus. Sometimes <laughs> yeah, full of uh, people, one bus, two bus, and then finally people in the bus yeah thinking yeah next uh, destination is the, the toilet. So okay yeah, they think uh, yeah we can do the toilet, but finally coming here and many people just come in and sit on and take a photos. So no toilet function is happening. And some of them are complaining about that because they, some of them seriously likes to do the toilet. And then finally the city government decided to put the kind of a temporary uh, toilet box behind this wall for the real use of the toilet. So it was, Funny, uh, how to say, you know, the first time in the history to put the toilet for the toilet, things happen <laughs> there. But uh, yeah, for me, it's of course funny, but at the same time, it's so serious how to think about how to deal with the nature things and architecture things. And, yeah. And this is a private house. And again, here we have kind of a layering of the boundaries. And sometimes we can make a nice in-between spaces, half outside and a half inside like things. And this house is, has a three boxes, box and box and box system. And then the big box and middle box, between the big box and middle box has, yeah, you can see the trees because it is outside, even inside of the big box, but it is outside because openings, many openings of the outside boxes has no glass. So it is kind of a, the in-between spaces like this. It's a garden, it has trees, it's high, it is outside, but still it is covered by big, big box with many, many openings. So it is like a room, but it is like a garden. And uh, it is, I got an inspiration from uh, Japanese in-between spaces from a traditional Japanese architecture. Yeah, we have been dealing that kind of uh, in-between spaces because in Japanese traditional architecture, we have a, a Japanese garden and a small Japanese house, but uh, the house is more part of the garden. And then house is 
the place to enjoy the garden. So the architecture are made as like a, such an in-between spaces. So I try to translate that kind of traditional in-between spaces into the contemporary architecture. And then this is uh, one of the, the, the answer to that. And uh, yeah, this is a simple diagram to show the uh, left hand, one strong line is usual wall to divide inside and outside. Usually uh, inside and outside clearly divided, but the right hand, this gradations is making more like a, the beautiful transitions from deep inside and the middle in between spaces to the outside. In, the, in this case, the transition gradation is, how to say, we could have choices where to sit on or where to be in this nice weather or sometimes where, how to say, more uh, getting more into the privacy areas. So this is a transition of the outside inside and publicness and privateness and in your daily life you could choose uh, as they like if you can provide that kind of transitions. Then I try to translate that kind of a gradation diagram into architecture like this. It's quite simple, box and box in plan and in section box and box and box. And finally, it's, it's like this, the white box in the residential area. It looks a bit strange because the, all the others is a, like a traditional house protecting inside and then small garden outside. But our house is, how to say, including outside areas by such a kind of a polar homeless shelters. And if you are inside, then it's, yeah, you, you see the trees and you see the sky, but you, uh, you have a shelters covering on it. And from the very, very deep inside, you will see the three layers of the boxes, small, middle, box, big, with many, many openings. Like uh, amazing things that you will see that kind of a fragment of the sky covering you. So it's really open feelings. But at the same time, you are in the middle of the three layers of the concrete boxes. So it's really protected. So here, the openness and protected feelings are coexistent. And the transparencies and the opaqueness are always changing according to your positions or according to your behaviors. So in, in that sense, how to open and how to close is relating to how to deal with the nature. So this house is based on that kind of a really fundamental uh, questions. And again, this is uh, the gardens again, uh, half outside, half inside the gardens. And this is... Uh, the examples, we didn't use any nature, but try to create kind of a forest-like experiences. This is a library in Tokyo, a library for art university. And as you can see, this library, all the walls are covered by the bookshelves. Yeah, because this is a library. So everything is covered by the bookshelves. And uh, yeah, the starting point was something like this. It's a starting from a small bookshelves. This is growing and growing, and then getting to that kind of a really uh, huge monsters of the bookshelves. And the, all the land areas are made by one continuous uh, But these bookshelves has openings like a previous house. It, it is the make. It is creating the feeling of the layering and then small openings to show another layers behind it. And then another opening to showing another uh, spaces behind it, behind it. Then you will feel like uh, you are in the middle of the, the layers of the bookshelves, but the more and more space are uh, uh, spreading around, surrounding you. But you don't see exactly what it is, but some small, how to say, hint is coming through the openings then it makes you to walk around. It's like a walking around in the forest. And they, I, I, I thought it's a really beautiful experience to think about the fundamental, how to say, the similarity between the library and the forest. Because if you are in the library, sometimes yeah, you just find some books or you just search some books. But sometimes you just walk around in the library for 
no purpose, just walking around. Then, look, yeah, just like uh, walking in the forest. And sometimes you will encounter unexpected books, or you will encounter some unexpected ideas. So that kind of uh, experience is, is one of the very fundamental meaning of the library, actual real space of the library. So we try to create such a forest-like meandering or exploring experiences using by super artificial uh, method. So this is, this is the answer for that. So you will see how the spiral shape is making the layering. So you, will, you are surrounded by many, many, many books. So if you like books, it's like a book heaven. It's really, really amazing place. But if you don't like book, it's really book hell. And then you, <laughs> you couldn't go out of the, the spaces almost endlessly, yeah, book and book and book and book uh, surrounding you. And then finally, it's, it's like this. And you will see how the layers of the, the bookshelves is making. And this, is, this area is a really high ceiling. And uh, yeah, you will see how empty the bookshelves is. I, yeah, maybe I made too much bookshelves. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the ceiling is, uh, is really beautiful. It has a skylights, but it, ha it is covered by the plastic materials, and then delicate uh, feelings of light are created, and uh, some kind of a reflections are happening, so that uh, you could see the bookshelf wall is not stopped by the, uh, by the ceilings, but the kind of a continuously going through the ceilings. So then it is really making a soft, uh, light, floating impression of the ceilings. And this is the main areas of the, the library. So you will see how the openings is making the view to the space behind it, behind it, behind it. And sometimes, yeah, or many times, yeah, big, these things happen. But I, yeah, I like <laughs> this photo very much because she is representing how comfortable this space is. <laughs> Actually, yeah, this system of the spiral is making the space between these walls and the scales of the gap of this wall is about four meters, five meters. So it's more like a kind of a private feelings, the domestic residential feeling. And at the same time, according to your positions, according to where you stand, then you will see this kind of a vast spreading uh, almost endlessly spreading really huge uh, space feelings. So you could have, how do I say, the opposite scales, really, really cozy, uh, residence-like, residence house-like, uh, living space-like, cozy areas. But on the other hand, it's really, really widely spreading forest-like feelings. And both scales is really essential for the library experiences, I think. So these systems is realizing the coexistence of the opposite small scales and large scales at the same time. And the evening, evening is something like this. So, okay, I have uh, two more projects. Now they are ongoing in, in France. Both of them, we won a competition uh, this year and the last year. This is a kind of a university building in Paris. And uh, yeah, this is the view of the inside. And we brought the trees inside as well as outside. And this is a place where, of course, they have a many, many classrooms like uh, usual uh, university buildings, but they like to have more new style of the learning spaces. So we provided many uh, platforms for now to use and uh, big staircases for several different uses and uh, for the auditorium-like usage of, uh, how to say, the landing spaces, and then combine them by many, many catwalks, many, many walkways to create the networks, the physical networks and the visual networks together, surrounding the, around these void spaces. So three-dimensional uh, visual, physical networks are happening. And from outside, it's something like this. It's a bit difficult to see 
uh, what is happening inside. But it's open, transparent facade with many trees. So trees outside is coming to inside, and then the networking uh, inside is coming out to to uh, for the facade. And this is this should be the center of the university where several different department students are coming together. So we create, in the middle of the building, we created a big void. Uh, and this void is made, it's like a heart of the buildings. And it has trees and the networking uh, walkways are around it. So this is the diagrams. Yeah, it's written in French because it was a, a French competition, so I couldn't read it. But I believe it's, it is explaining uh, kind of essential concept. The image above is, it's like a, how to say, the many platforms or staircases in the middle of the trees. It's like a tree house. And then three dimensionally, visually connected together. So that's uh, the first inspiration. And then the image below is more showing the practical sections. The left hand's more usual traditional classroom. And then it's getting more and more uh, how to say open platforms and then coming into the trees to create more how to say, interactive spaces. So this is the actual sections. It's almost like uh, from the concept into the into the real real architecture. So trees inside, trees outside are uh, surrounded by many platforms and the staircases and walkways to create like a, a three-dimensional forest-like. Uh, areas and then again it's like a tree climbing uh, feelings where you can choose uh, any places you like or stop by or inspired by some activities uh, below or above or something like that and this is a plan so you will see how the central void has many walkways and staircases and surrounded by the really traditional classroom and again, yeah, this is a view inside, something like this. So now we uh, just fix the contract, so we start the, the design process. We will be finished 2018, so in, in three years. Okay, so this is the last one. This is a, a, a French project. It's an uh, apartment uh, housing in southern France, in Montpellier. And uh, yeah, this is something like this crazy uh, balcony monster because their climate, the Mediterranean south of France climate is like a really, how to say, nice or warm weather. Even in winter time, they uh, go out for lunch to have a lunch on the terraces. So that is the tradition uh, of their lifestyle. So we try to translate that kind of their lifestyle, their climate into the contemporary architecture. And then finally, yeah, the simple idea is to put huge balconies for their uh, living areas, not only one balcony, but the two, three balconies for the apartment. So it is really huge. And uh, it will, the biggest one is the six meter by eight meter. So it's like a, another uh, living spaces. And some of them are pagola to block the strong sunlight to create the whole, uh, how to say, the organizations. And it is like a, like a one big tree with many, many people are uh, living on each different branches. This is on the, located on the river. So the whole shape itself is uh, created by the relationship with the urban, urban conditions, the site and the roundabout and the green belt uh, alongside the rivers are defining this rather strange soft shape. But because of this soft shape, the whole impression is more like a, not just a, how to say, the apartment with the balconies, but more organic, uh, organic uh, unities are realized. And then you will see how the balconies are sticking out. And sometimes the apartment unit has a double floor, like a duplex. And then two different level big balconies are sticking out from each levels. And then 
connected by the outdoor staircases as well as indoor staircases. So it's really three-dimensional uh, living, living environments uh, are created. And most of the windows are like a really big open window. So it's indoor living space, outdoor living space are well, well connected. And in the evening, yeah, it's like this. But uh, yeah, of course, this image is beautiful. But I am expecting the lives on the terraces are uh, getting more and more active. For example, after 10 years, the parcels and uh, many, many different colors of the things are coming out. And finally, yeah, the architecture itself is almost like a get behind. And the lifestyle itself is, is like a, looks like an architecture. And then finally, it is representing uh, their lifestyle, their identity, their climate conditions to be their I say, icon of the old city. So I am expecting like that. And uh, unfortunately, the whole apartment, 105 apartments, are sold out. So uh, you couldn't get it now. <laughs> but. <laughs> So then we are the last phase of the design process. And uh, fortunately, the uh, building permissions are finally, we, get, we got it. After two months of the, how to say, protesting period, we safely passed that. And uh, so now we can, we can make it. The beginning of next year, we will start construction. And we will be finished two, three years. So I'm really looking forward to see how the local people will make this architecture hiding by their by their daily daily staffs. So okay, this is the last images, and uh, yeah, yeah. Today I show how I'm struggling to deal with nature and architecture uh, things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, refresh yourself there so for just a moment. We're gonna move into our questions. I'm gonna ask a couple and then um, we'll go to the audience. I'm gonna shorten mine. I'm so glad that this talk worked because we had, when we knew that it, it, it might turn out that so it couldn't be here, we had to arrange for something different. And I, I think this was much better than the alternative, which was an interpretive dance um, put on by, uh, uh, the director, uh, the new uh, director of Cranbrook Academy Art, uh, Chris Scotes, and Rick Rogers called Art Schools in the City. And I just think this is better, the way it worked out. I, I really do. So, but I want to thank them both for, for their rehearsal this afternoon, which is interesting. It's truly unique. Um, so I, I, looking at the two of, trying to resolve the two of these, I, uh, these two architects and designers today, I thought was going to be difficult, but in fact it's not, uh, because your work overlaps in such interesting and intriguing ways. Can you hear us in New York? Yes. Yes, good. But uh, a bit difficult for me to understand, but it's okay, yeah, I will try. All right, I'll, I'll slow down and speak a little louder, um, <laughs> because that's what you always do when someone's having trouble understanding you. <laughs> it doesn't help. You, you didn't get to see Walter's work, but both of you seem to be exploring the edge, edges uh, between built, the built environment and the natural environment, and how one traverses those, how one goes back and forth across them. Both a physical edge, like a part of a building, but also the emotional uh, or the intellectual edge between them. And, and uh, we saw a number of projects that talked about that. I wonder how one translates that kind of question to the scale of a whole city. You know, how do you, when you take on a city like Detroit, which large sections of it have been removed over time, uh, is there a way to, can you address that same sort of issue uh, at that scale? So what, we'll start with you and then, then we'll go to Walter. 
Shall I start? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really yeah fundamental question, but at the same time very difficult. I think the scale is is quite essential to create that kind of a transitions or the mixtures of the things. As you can see, yeah, I try to pixelize sometimes the architecture into smaller pieces to make more blurring boundaries. So if you try to, for example, pixelize a city, then it is one pixel is, for example, architecture or house. And then it is not like a pixelized yet. Then if you try to pixelize architecture into such a small things, then for the larger size of the city, it has less impact, I'm afraid. So every time the balances of the scales, how the smaller scales and the bigger scales and the larger and larger scales are, how to say, interacting together to create such a, such a mixture. So it is quite an exciting question, but uh, wow, it is, it is difficult. But, uh, I only can say really big inspiration from the city of Tokyo, as I showed at the first, first image. Because the city of Tokyo is, of course, it has a big infra infrastructure, it has a big block. But uh, if you are in the middle of the uh, really Tokyo-like residential area, then the whole thing you can see is just a small pieces of uh, their daily staffs or the small bicycles or small billboards or the electricity cables, everything is already tiny scales fragmented. And it relates to the people's life. So in that sense, I think, and then of course, after that, you will see more middle size or bigger size frames of the architecture or bigger blocks. So scales from a really small things into the larger uh, orders is making kind of a, how to say, nice living environment, I feel. Good. Walter, thank you. Walter. Oh, I, I would um, kind of build on what Sue was saying. I like the idea of the pixel, the building as the pixel, because what it begins to do, it begins to, I guess, de-emphasize the box as the main thing and the box as a series of things that sit in a plane. So if you can somehow conceptualize a density of a neighborhood as a set of points, and then how you pixelize them, I would imagine that would be based on the relationships you might want between them, between inside and outside, the relationship between a larger kind of field of inquiry. Uh, I thought the big difference, though, between the way Sue is working is, is, is really more metaphorical, right? Mm -hmm. Utilizing, looking at landscape and having landscape literally act as a metaphor for ways to break down the box right, in a lot of diverse environments. And I also thought your work was very cultural, you know, to Japan, and I was interested when it jumps out of Japan, you know, what's the embrace, and your, your note about you're interested to see how people inhabit this in France is kind of interesting, where I would look at our work as being culturally very American. We're really interested in the culture of America and how people inhabit places. And I think between architecture and landscape, the way I was looking at your work was much more focused in to go out, and we're focused more out to go in, which I think I'm more interested in the horizon, I'm much more interested in that out there, and I think you're interested in it as well, but you're interested by going in and then by going back out. Mm -hmm. Did you mm -hmm. want to add anything to that, Sue? Wow, yes, I, I think the inside and outside things is always very exciting for um, architects. Sue, because, higher. Hi, we, we can't hear you. Would you tell your technician we can't? Can hear? Up can there, I? yep, good. Perfect. We got you, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I would be more closer to the microphone. Uh, yeah, inside and outside thing is quite uh, exciting for architects, yeah, because architects is always making, have to make inside, but then at the same time, we, ha we like to break out that kind of a simple definition of uh, making architecture. So bringing inside some outside things and something like that. So the pixelizing things is uh, one of the one of the the method. But if you see the nature things, then nature has, in a sense, it's a, like a beautiful transition. No pixelizing. It's more like a big order, middle order, small order, micro orders into the 
how to say, the ad atom or something like that. So nature has such a really powerful, uh, beautiful orders of the transitions. So I, I'm, it's a pity for me as an architect. Every time we have to just imitate nature things in a really rough scales. And sometimes it's a bit, uh, how to say, yeah, it's, it's a quite difficult to, to make a balance of the artificial things and the nature things. So it is always the challenges and uh, yeah, the big, big question. You know, one can look at cities, Tokyo included um, many cities around the world, over the last four or 500 years as a long running attempt on the part of human beings to control and contain nature. Uh, really, the other way around, contain and thereby control nature. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the work that you all are doing, in a way, it's trying to break that model. It's trying to break down that hard edge, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of edge that gives you a wonderful central park. I mean, in, in, in many ways, it's a, you can see positive things, um, but you can also see negative things because it's just so hard and it's so artificial. I, I see both of you, am, am I correct that I see both of you trying to break that edge? And if you do break that edge at the scale of the city, how does that start to affect the way we live? Let's start with Walter. Well, I'll go first. I mean, I think it affects us because it, it breaks the boundary and it forces us to have relationships with each other, right? I mean, to me, it's boring to do, uh, well, I find it now in my career very boring to do uh, a kind of a homogeneous plaza or park, you know, that has all the accoutrements. And once you start looking closely at different places, they have ways of kind of generating their own kind of form. And so if I say I'm not really going to hold the boundary, different places will break that boundary in different ways. And a lot of it has to do with the thickness of the ground. A lot of it has to do with the geology. A lot of it has to do with just the place. And when I was showing the Pittsburgh project, what was really beautiful, those two rivers, actually as soon as people left, the black locust came in and just took over. And then the Atlantis came in and said, I'm breaking up some houses. And before you know it, there's this really amazing successional landscape where most people, if you ask them, they wouldn't say the emergent species were any different than a, a tree that you planted. Because once they achieve their certain height, now the biggest thing is it's messy. And I would think that's the biggest difference between us. We just hate messy places. We are always cleaning things up to be tidy because we want to control them. And messiness means, if, if it's, things are out of order, it means it's out of control. And control is one of those things that, particularly in landscape and in architecture, you know, we want to have control. In architecture, you have to, to a certain degree. But I would argue in landscape, unless it's directly tied to those direct patterns and practice of habitation, a lot of that control we can let go. Because the beautiful thing of it is, we don't really know what we might get. And to me, I find that exciting. Some people find that scary. But I find it exciting to the next year, like we have a drought in California now. Mm. It would be really interesting to see what landscape would have produced itself versus we have this issue now of having to maintain that thing. And so we have no water. And so people are like, going, well, how do I water my lawn? You don't, you know? <laughs> if you don't have a lawn, what would you have? And it's interesting, the landscape will take care of it. And as soon as the water comes, it'll, it'll come back. But if we don't have that kind of sort of view of place, it's really hard to let go. And not knowing where you live, it's really hard to let go until it let goes and informs you of where you are. And then you really won't let it go, i.e. New Orleans, i.e. Washington, D.C., i.e. the Bay Area. You know, these, these big events happen and people aren't prepared for it because we've been holding the dam back right. for so long. We don't have any ebb and flows or ways to understand those flows. Sue, did you want to add uh -huh. to that? Wow, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I understand uh, everything uh, the Walter says, but uh, it's okay. Yeah, I think <laughs> when I, we, we didn't when I think it. about <laughs> <laughs> So, Jump right in, yeah, you have I nothing to I, lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when I think about, for example, thinking to make in the city, 
then big nature is, for example, we can make a park. It's like, a, for example, the central park. It's a, it's a really big nature. And then inside of the big park, then the full nature is not realized. But then if you like to break down that kind of a nature, then, for example, yeah, we can make a small park or a small, small park. And maybe, for example, the rooftop garden or the balcony gardens or such kind of things. So, yeah, we can we could imagine smaller size natures could be scattered throughout the city, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then yeah. <laughs> not sure. For example, in Tokyo, we have a back on the back street. You you can find many many small pods planted with a messy a flowers or vegetations maintained by the old ladies and the not well maintained. But uh, yeah, it looks like a fancy, how to say, fancy situations. Not beautiful, <laughs> but uh, kind of a positively funny, funny things is happening. And then finally, the Tokyo small residential areas are nicely uh, like a mixture of the green and the uh, urban situations in, in a smaller scales. And I, I don't know how we can, it is happening now. So it is not like a, the proposal for me, but it is just happening situations. And I'm not sure how we could get an inspiration from that situation and then to talk about what kind of a visions for the future uh, urban situations. I'm not really yet sure, but I think it is something between the big park or uh, no park uh, city situations. It's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's very exciting to anticipate looking forward. Uh, If we have a very rigid sort of distinction between nature and the built environment now, something a little more heathered or feathered, if you will, uh, moving forward is actually very exciting. Your projects both, both address that. I'd, I'd like to ask you just one more question, which means that you need to start preparing your questions. Because if you don't have any, I will ask you questions. <laughs> and I know a lot of you. So this could get very embarrassing. So I think it's good to prepare. Just I'm going to ask a question of the two of you that's very specific and, and, and directed, um, rather than the last two questions, which were quite open. Both of you travel a great deal. Um, both of you see many cities and, and what's going on in those cities. And of course, we know that the topic tonight that we're dealing with uh, thanks to Jane, is uh, the, re- the greening of Detroit, the, re- the greening of the city, not just Detroit, but the greening of the city. Are there specific projects, just one even, that you have seen in other cities that might have a lesson for Detroit in them that you could share with us? Uh, and, and, and I'll give you w- one example um, that's a favorite of mine because I got to work on it and it, I think it's, it's been wonderful and I think a lot of people know it, which is the High Line in New York. How many of us have visited the High Line? Great, yes, good project. And it, the way it greens New York is quite simple and very specific. It, it recreates a, a patch of greenery on an, an abandoned rail line that's in the air, right? And then adds to that and creates a new set of in, a greened environments in a city where green is very precious. There's not a lot of green in New York outside of the parks. So that's one example. So do you guys have exa- just one example from somewhere else that you might want to share with us? Let's, Sue, you want to start on that? Wow. Wow, of course, yeah. I was thinking about the High Line, of course. Of course you were. <laughs> why, why do you think I used that example? <laughs> I always take the easy ones. Yes, that's my job yeah. as moderator. Yeah. So let me think a little bit. All right, well, let's, let's see if Walter has one that he's come up with. This is called Stump the Panel. Uh, I mean, I would say Xochimilco in oh. Mexico City yeah. for a lot of reasons. That's um, a good choice. 
Xochimilco, and if you go today, it's not, you know, it's not kept in great shape, mm -hmm. but the idea that Mario, when he worked with the community of Xochimilco, if you guys don't know it, it's in Mexico City, <laughs> but it builds on the foundation of how the city of Mexico was started, that you had a lake and that they figured out that by scooping up the alluvium from the bottom of the lake and building these small islands that they could actually grow produce. And over time, that became a way of moving around and actually became an ecology. Uh, it's a forced ecology, but it's something that's authentic to this mm -hmm. place. Uh, this is what you have to do when you live on a lake. And so that kind of, the, the, the truth of that to me is, is what's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have said the High Line. I love the High Line. I love DSR, I love Liz, I love the High Line, but I don't find the High Line as a great greening strategy. And that's just my opinion because it's, a, it's an industrial relic mm -hmm. that we just choose, chose to romanticize. A lot of places don't romanticize the relic. They actually reuse the relic that's and they incorporate the relic into their daily lives in a much more, I find, profound way. That's a uh, fair critique. It's like the column of the lady in, in Rome. You know, you walk down the street in Rome, the old lady comes out. Come in. And you go upstairs and there's a freaking column in her kitchen. Right. Right? They just built it around the column because that's really important to their identity. And to me, I mean, again, I love the High Line. I go there every time I go to New York and I understand where it comes from. But I don't think, and as Liz would say this too, she has a great lecture on the copies of High Lines, mm -hmm. how every city has copied the High Line. And I think we can be inspired by these projects, but we have to look particularly at the place that we live in and look for you know, specificity of place. I, I think that's a fantastic answer, and I think it's particularly good for us here in Detroit. How many of us, every one of us in this room, has spent time next to a relic uh, in Detroit of something? It's an old automobile factory, or it's a, an abandoned this, or a torn down that. And, and you look at it and you think, it's just an object and it no longer means anything to me. Or it means something negative. The battles over the train station, right? The battles over, over, the, over the old abandoned train station. Is it an eyesore? Right. Is, it, is it an important cultural relic? And going back and forth. That's, that's a fantastic But point. I was in an alley today. I mean, where is he? I just saw him. You guys' alley, right? Uh, where you're using transformers as places to hang picture frames. Mm -hmm. So you know, and I thought, my immediate thought was that they raised the transformers. And then when I found out, no, they were there. And they just looked at them and went, wow, look at those. How do we begin them. to incorporate that? Not to say, we're, they're not hiding them. Right. So against that parking garage, I see these things. And of course, I make that connection. I know where I am. I know what they're doing. And it doesn't mean I have to like go to school and get a PhD to understand it. But I, there's a comfort to me in this kind of authenticity of the act. Yeah, right? it's a great answer. So did you want to add something, or should we go to the audience? You don't have to. Well, please go to the audience. I couldn't find a... <laughs> That's fine. So we'll, let's, let's, let's open it up for questions now. Um, this is going to have to work slightly differently, because Sue's in New York, um, and he, he's not going to be able to hear you answer a question, or ask a question. So I'm going to just point at people who want to ask a question. Go ahead and ask it, and then you're just going to hear me repeat it. Um, I do love to hear myself talk. <laughs> and, and I thank you for giving me this opportunity. But I, it's, it's unfortunately the only way to make this work. So, do we have a question? Yes, ma'am, right here down front. So the question is, where is your next project? Is it the one you showed us in France? Uh, but, okay. <laughs> Uh, what, 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 what is your, what is the next, your next most, uh, the project you're working on next? Where is it? Oh, wow. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> choose, choose one. Actually, uh, recently I have a, yeah, this two projects I showed is a uh, rather major uh, thing. So uh, I, now recently I'm doing something in the U.S., Los Angeles, and uh, Brazil, Sao Paulo, or Chile, and of course in China, and Budapest. So it's, it's, it's strange. It is, it is spreading. So I'm in the one project in Bali, Indonesia. So it, it's exciting to, so it, it's, to have that kind of diversity of varieties. It's good that you're young, in other words. <laughs> Next question, yes, way up there in the back, a hand in the air. Yeah, I wanted to ask specifically, um, 
you mentioned working in communities uh, and being people centric. In Detroit, there's a huge issue uh, within the neighborhoods where there's a lot of blighted property, a lot of burnt out homes. Uh, can you give us some ideas or just talk about ways that that might be approached uh, from a person centric or neighborhood centric way in terms of uh, landscape architecture? What ways can landscape architecture sort of be used to maybe soothe the psyche of children who are walking to school and seeing burnt down buildings and abandoned homes, things of that nature. What ways could uh, some of the work that you guys do uh, address some of those problems? I'm going to assume that question is for Walter. Uh, for both. Oh, for both. All right. Well, let's start with Walter. I mean, I would say, I mean, I've seen the neighborhoods and you know, toured around, and I think one of the most powerful things we do is to change the sociology of that space. If we leave the buildings there, we leave the roads there, we leave the vacancy there, then that says one thing. That says we're waiting for something or we don't care, right? And I think there are great models, right, in the history of planning. We were talking earlier about really thinking about different patterns that people can live together. Maybe, you know, in the 20th century, maybe it was the gridiron single family open lot plan. Maybe the 21st century are a series of smaller little collective units that have big, broad landscapes. But I think you have to have a vision and talk to people about, I guess, how they want to live in the future. And you know, maybe people want to go back to the open, single family open lot plan and the streets in a grid. But maybe people are looking for an alternative. And that alternative can come through, I guess, just being, again, truthful in a place that, you know, thinking if I got six houses and I got a snaggle tooth of eight, you know, maybe the road can be reconfigured to make people see the landscape differently. Because right now, we're reading the landscape from a grid iron plan. That's why it looks the way it looks. But take out the grid iron, it will look completely different in different places. So I think there are strategies that we know. Uh, we were talking about Baldwin Hills in Los Angeles, still has its value. It's in South Central. Went through the riots, went through everything. You still can go to Baldwin Hills, still has its Stein and Wright. A very simple idea, taking the car, flipping it outside, giving people a shared green on the inside. People feel protected, they have a community, but there are great examples, village homes in Davis, California. No one copied the model, done in the 70s. You know, and that model still exists today. Not again, the gridiron plan. And I'm not talking about a suburban plan, I'm talking, these are very urban plans. And so I think we can even look to other places like Tokyo and other places of how to handle density. It handles, I mean, if you just look at architecture and planning history, there are these great models out there. But I think we're stuck in this kind of a single family open lot plan, streets that are too wide, we've got to have our car on the streets, and we're stuck in this model. And I think you guys have a great opportunity, the people who live here, to start changing the model. Who's been to Portland? Right? Portland said, screw the fire truck. Screw all these standards. And what they did, they took the fire truck out there and said, it ain't that big, you can turn around. And they changed the model in this little town. It was a small group of people who said, we can change these things. So now, Portlandia exists, right? That's an invention. That came out of people saying, we're tired of doing these big infrastructural things, and we want to have greener communities, we want to have walkable space, that we care about these things, and we live next to a river. All of that became the argument to change the sociology. And so when you go to Portland, that's why it feels that way. You can walk up, you can walk up. But the landscape, you understand the landscape, and those are really important decisions. I mean, these are decisions that you can't make as a resident. This is a political decision. This is something that everybody has to sort of get behind. But I think it's possible. Let's take a new question. Uh, yes, ma'am, over here. Hi, good evening, and thank you for your inspirational talks. Uh, a question for Walter. Um, and I'm going to kind of tie it into uh, the lecture that was last night with Will Bauer. Mm -hmm. And he talked about uh, urban uh, agriculture and reclaiming the dirt and growing your own dirt. And so all of this, all of these vacant lots can be remediated. And with that in mind, planting prairie plant, and, and your idea of letting nature just take over. My concern is, and I don't need to tell the standards if anything new, but we have a problem with invasive species. So even though we want to let the landscape go, we need to manage it in some way to keep out foreigners and keep in our natives. How would you propose 
that would do that without a lot of maintenance and you know an extra extra help in hand that we need to pay. So this question was for Walter, and it's about landscape architecture in the city. <laughs> okay. That's a great question. I mean, it's, and it's loaded as well. Um, but again, I would start with, again, thinking about the pattern of the landscape, right? I mean, how do we want to make a city before I get into letting things go and what it should be? And I think that's the morphology of the city, right? And the morphology, I mean, the structure. You know, how do we want to live? And I think that then allows you to think of what you need to let go and what, where you need to put the emphasis. Um, a couple of things though, I mean, I, and this is a personal view of myself, I mean, I think urban agriculture is good, but I don't think it's the answer, you know, at the scale of the city. Um, I think, you know, I grew up in, we had a garden in our backyard, my father had a quarter acre, you know, I, we had our food in our yard. People in single family lots, they utilize that. And so we really have to think about, when we think about these larger pieces, who's actually going to utilize it? If people are owning houses, just like parks. Uh, there was a study that found that if you have a single family house in the front yard and the backyard, you use the park rarely. And we then spend money to take care of that. So if we start just thinking of those metrics, that might allow us to kind of understand where to put the, the emphasis. The other piece you talked about, though, was the invasives. Um, and this is the thing in landscape architecture there's a lot of debate about today. And for me, what do you mean by invasives, right? When we think about native landscapes, right? The landscapes in which we live are cultural landscapes. We created them, right? I live in a landscape that wants to just be grass. No trees. <laughs> Spaniards came in and planted trees. Why? Because they were hot, right? We plant, we make these landscapes because we want them. So what's invasive? We have a river out there, right? Stuff can come from the river and see itself. To me, that's native, right? Again, we have to learn to think about it. When you live next to a river, you don't have much control over stuff. The LA River, you go in the LA River, you can find geraniums, palm trees. Why? Because it's not in the air. The birds come and poop, boom. It's local. <laughs> right? And that local ecology, this is what excites me. That, that we, we can't get our head around. That's living. Right? When things start changing, you know, the birds that stuff on the wire and crap on the wire and make a fence. Right in South Carolina. That's when you're talking about living right in the trees or living in a place. So I do think all of these things are possible, but we have to just change our perception of what the landscape is. Uh, yes, way in the back corner. Hi. Hi. Um, I think one of the most important questions for us is that we're a post-industrial world with a industrial landscape. And that landscape is certainly in ruin in so many places in our city. And nature is now taking over that landscape in really beautiful and exciting ways. So this interface of nature and landscape and industry and architecture is really at the center of who we are as a city. And what should we be doing? Do we want to let nature take over all this historic and important architecture and just watch the demise and this beautiful reclaiming of what was once man-made by Mother Nature, or do we keep it and stabilize it in a certain place and use it as examples of our past, like the Forum in Rome or something like that? I mean, it's a big question I think we have to deal with, and deal with it before we don't have, any, we don't have the choice. And maybe we don't want the choice, but I think it's important. Sue, so I'm going to give you this question, um, and, and it was that in Detroit, we have many old ruined buildings that are slowly being overtaken by nature, um, and ma most of them abandoned. And the question, and I'm gonna paraphrase, and I'm sorry to do that. The question was, should we allow that process to continue? Should we let them continue to go back to nature? Or is there another approach? Uh, should we you know, hold back that process somehow? And so, that's the question for you. Wow. Honestly, I like the ruins. <laughs> With the uh, trees or greens, uh, how to say, growing inside, because it is kind of a beautiful mixture of the artificial things and the natural things. But uh, it's, it's good to see, but uh, it's a bit difficult to, to use 
for our daily activities. But uh, for example, the, the project House N, uh, it is a boxing, boxing, box, street boxing, boxing, box house, and by Amber Louis like things. Just a structure without any glass or something. Then we could have trees or greens together with the, the artificial things. So, of course, just let them go is a little bit pity. So, I, I think it's it's nice to think about how really like situations with greens could be useful for our, our life. You know, it could be kind of a new definition of the park, or could bring some of the artificial activities inside, not wiping out the greens, but keeping the greens, but still how to utilize some of the, the remaining of the structures. So, not just wiping out all the structures, all the greens out and to make a new buildings, but not just to keep it as it is, but uh, optimizing the existing in between situations, half ruined, half major situations, to make a unique urban space is, I think, an exciting challenge and could have some uniqueness and possibilities, I believe. Great. Um, I'm going to just take one more question and I'm going to be a young lady right down here in the front. So the next question was to Walter, and it's about how to um, make people in the city, how to address the question of gentrification uh, in the city. So Walter's going to answer that one. Well, I'm not going to speak specifically to gentrification, because I don't think that's what she was no, asking, right? Sorry. I know. Um, but the solution of how do you get people involved that one may be left out, two, there might be major cultural differences. Uh, social, cultural, and economic differences. And with change in cities, the new gentry. I do think having a new demographic come in. I live in Oakland, and, you know, the hipsters arrived, you know, in 2008. You know, I love it, just trying some of this one. But, you know, they changed the city. We have bike lanes, we have bars, bourbons everywhere, you know. And people are thinking about, whoa, what happened, right? But I think, I mean, as designers, we have to inspire. You know, and I don't take it lightly. Every project we work on, we have to find a way to communicate to the people. It's not a homogeneous, it's not a standard thing. In the Hill District, I taught people on walks. They thought I was crazy, right? I mean, I was telling people in the Hill, I basically said, look, you have the same landscape as people have in Shinley Park, which is a 19th century suburb. They do people live in ravines. They have deer in their backyard. So don't tell me that I can't have this downtown. Right? And we can empower people through that, through that knowledge. And to me, every project, we have to figure out a way to come in and to have that conversation. I do the conversation then can become healthy. It's not a pity conversation, one or the other. And I mean, it's a really hard thing to do. I mean, a lot of people don't do a lot of community participation in one of the people who came out of civil rights, which really started it. A lot of the people who taught me, they don't do it anymore because of the, the 80s and the 90s. Right? They said, I mean, I've had people tell me, I can't do this anymore because they don't respect me in that community. It just really means that you keep doing the same thing. If you go to a community and give them post it to go, what do you want? And you keep doing it, I'm not going to respect you either. But you got to inspire me. Come in and show me something. Give me some of your knowledge. Show me what you see and then allow me to sort of be empowered through that lens of your profession. And I think it's all for everyone. I have a question for you. You did a good job. <laughs> it's not too personal. 
How many of you think that Detroit is better off for having had Sue Fujimoto and Walter Hood here with us tonight? I've got a follow-up, <laughs> if you can handle it. How many of you think Detroit is better off for having had Jane Shulak here with us tonight? Your suitcases are at Jane Shulak's house. We have them. <laughs> I can tell you one thing, one thing that I know as someone who's no longer in Detroit and misses it a great deal. We're all better off that you are here tonight. And so on behalf of Rip Rapson, the Detroit Institute of Arts, Jane and Eddie Shulak, Sue Fujimoto and Walter Hood. I thank you for coming out this night and staying with us and being so patient with our technological difficulties. Have a wonderful evening.